Okay, split this up into two pieces. So this is part two, and we are just starting off. Where are we starting? Week eight. Tumors of the spine, our favorite part. So, I mean, when you see something like this, you know, the cells are growing it's wild inside here and expanding the, the bones out. So this has got to be some type of cancer. So it's almost always metastatic and uh, breast likes the spine. So is the prostate though. But uh, breast cancer, uh, primary, metastatic. So you, if you see this, this is a metastatic lesion of the spine. This one is, the, we talked about this several times. When you see one this big, we're going to guess a schwannoma. Schwannoma. And note the findings, note the scalping of the posterior vertebra, vertebral bodies here and sacral bodies. So uh, what's the other one that can look just like this? The one that likes the phylum terminale and conus medullaris? Remember the, uh, the mixopapillary pendymoma? So if you said that, I would give credit for either a schwannoma or mixopapillary pendymoma. Don't say a pendymoma because there's different flavors of those. you got to know it's the mixopapillary flavor. might be easier just to say schwannoma. Uh, remember this one? You guys miss this one a lot. You can't miss things like this. So you look at the frame. And I know sometimes framing look this big on x-ray. But the key is to go down and look at all the framing. Okay, so here's your normal size. There's your typical hourglass. So that's get that's getting too big. You can especially when you see some of the uh, posterior part of the body is eroded away here, and this is definitely way too big, right? And you got erosion there, so you got some kind of a uh, tumor that's encroaching into the neural foramen. And so what does that is the question. Again, the pendymoma likes that. It's the most common tumor of the spine. Can anything else do that? Neurofibroma can do it as well. we'll actually, we'll go over a list of things that can do that. So here's, we've been over this before, but it's probably might be back again. So here's the end of the spinal cord, right? Conus medullaris. You, what type of tumor likes the conus medullaris? That's the mixopapillary pendymoma. So you've got to say that for there. 90% of all tumors of the conus medullaris are mixopapillary pendymomas. That one's too high. So, but here's a nice view. Might pop up again. Got that dumbbell shape. That's a dumbbell tumor, right? Dumbbell tumors. Well, again, when it's massive like this, schwannoma. Right? Schwannoma, dumbbell tumor. Uh, you can't really tell this apart, though, from another one who likes to make dumbbells. That's a neurofibroma, also likes to make dumbbells. So if you said neurofibroma or schwannoma, that would be fine for this one. Okay, I would study this image. Okay, this is actually a cigar shape from this view. These are what are these? These are neurofibromas. What, you see anything else on this? I mean, we went over in class, hope you're not missing it. What's this thing? It's not a gourd. That's a bladder that is just massively filled up. It's neurogenic bladder. Patients got caught equina secondary to these tumors. Know your herniations, we talked about those already talked about this. Don't miss this. What the heck is that? It's way too low. You don't see a shadow down that low. That's your spleen. It's a large spleen. Same with the liver. Way too low. You don't see this normally. So this was secondary to leukemia. And let's not miss the easy ones. There's the cut line going right through that divot. That's right. It's just a simple old plain old schmoral snow. That's not like a bullet hole or tumor. That's a simple Schmorl's node. We've looked at that one already. We've looked at, I think we've looked at already, multiple compression fractures, osteoporosis, 
is for sure you can say osteoporosis um, this is multiple myeloma definitely there's what's that thing you can't miss that that's an abdominal aneurysm we do have questions on abdominal aneurysms there's another dumbbell tumor what would that be neurofibroma okay we went through all these Okay, definitely read through this. There's a few questions on these as well. I'd read through this material. Definitely know this. Four most common types of intradural spinal tumors. The, the algorithm I made up is same. Schwannoma, astrocytoma, meningioma, ependymoma. Our friend there. So these are the four most common types of intradural spinal tumors. Now remember, there's another category. There's intramedullary and extramedullary, but um, just know that. Know that category, or know that algorithm, for, or that analogy, or that mnemonic. Oh, my brain's going already. Same. This is actually the second time I made this. I hate Camtasia, I will publicly say. Camtasia is a wonderful program, but my God, they cannot get things right. I did a whole hour uh, review for you, and I lost it. And I won't get into all the details, but oh, I hate Cam. Everybody think negative thoughts about Camtasia right there. Okay, I digress again. Okay, you should be familiar with these: the ependymomas, the flavors. There's a question or two on that you need to know this material. We know this one real well already, the myxopapillary pendymoma. Loves the conus medullaris and phylum terminale. Okay. Schwannoma, it's the most common form. Uh, well, in this text, this is from uh, Hyatt, it was a spinal cord tumor book, $300 book. Very expensive. Uh, but there are some papers that say um, schwannomas aren't always the most common. Neurofibromas also can happen, but I guess we better go by this. So the most common form of dumbbell tumor is a schwannoma. Oh, I think that mech, that jives with what I said back there. You should definitely know this, though. Uh, when seen in children, they're very high risk of malignancy. They're usually not in adults that malignant. Any of these tumors can be malignant. Usually they're not, but when they're seen in children, that's a much greater chance it could be a malignant tumor. Let's see, this study, yeah, this study actually confirmed that. So, so in this study, the dumbbell tumor, 69% of uh, over 600 cases were actually schwannomas. 8% more malignant. Okay. We've talked about that already. talked about that we talked about that I think we're getting near the end of this leukemia we talked about that already right the liver and the spleen way too big cute leukemia about that don't worry about the X stop uh, we definitely need to, uh, abdominal aneurysms I don't think I've talked about that I, I mean I have that's why I'm getting confused because I just made this not too long ago and have to remake it now but a promise is a promise right so you can see where the abdominal aortas occur see 
back there, those are the renal arteries, so it's just inferior to the renal arteries. And there's the superior mesenteric artery, usually includes that. Some of our cadavers actually have these that you guys probably saw. Uh, definitely study this. There's a couple questions on this. They, If they rupture, it's bad news. It's a 90% mortality rate. And don't worry about the numbers, but uh, they happen much more prevalent, six up to six times more often in males. Uh, we're not sure why that is. Uh, genetic link, don't worry about the incidence, but know that there's ballooning. Uh, know the definition. If the abdominal error is, is increased by double, it's considered an aneurysm. It's your job to refer them out of the office if you catch that on MRI. Uh, we talked about that takeoff, we talked about that. Uh, ultrasound is gold standard, inexpensive. Well, not that exp inexpensive, but. And definitely know that Medicare does pay for this. So it's a good idea to have, especially if there's a family history uh, or you have these risk factors, you should know some of these risk factors too. If they have any of these in the history, Family history of aneurysms, abdominal aortic aneurysm, coronary artery disease, smoking, uncontrolled hypertension, COPD, history of large volume clotting, they should have uh, this screened. And Medicare will pay for it. I think you're 63 and a half or whatever it is these days. Medicare will pay for it. So good idea, good thing to have in your chart notes. Referred patient out for a routine screening of the abdom abdominal aneurysm aneurysm. I think it was, wasn't it the 10th cause? Yeah, that's the 10th leading cause of death in elderly males. So, I mean, it's down there a ways on the list, but it's worth referring them, I think. We talked about that already. Those are neurofibromas. Okay, I think we talked about that enough. All right, we're getting close here. Uh, we're in week nine now. Uh, there's the quiz again. Let's sip through that. We've seen all that. Sciatica, definitely know it's a horrible disease. I'm one of its victims, so I can tell you straight out, it is a nasty disease. You should know that it's been around forever. Uh, at least 1550 BC, the first written record of it. And we're probably not a heck of a lot better treating it now than way back then. Don't worry about that stuff. Definitely know the definition. No, I got a, one of my pet peeves is sciatica is really a slang term. It, the correct term is radicular pain. Um, and they're going to use sciatica, radicular pain, uh, radiculopathy, and even if they're really out of the loop radiculitis often aka's but it's really radicular pain uh, sciatica may be acceptable uh, radiculopathy you're going to see but the sciatic and radiculopathy don't really describe this condition what the heck is radicular pain it means that the nerve roots are inflamed irritated causing spontaneous firing of the nociceptive fiber within them at the root level at the level around the disc Piriformis syndrome, does that cause radicular pain? No, not technically because it doesn't uh, doesn't happen at the root level. It happens down in the butt. Definitely know the roots of the sciatic nerve, L4, 5, S1, or know at least those roots because there's a question about myalgia paralytica, which you should know. What's myalgia par paralytica? Remember that one? You get a hip pointer in football. Remember the lateral femoral cutaneous nerve supplies the anterior lateral part of the thigh with sensation and you can get a rip roaring inflammation of that nerve and it just it hurts incredibly bad and it's often difficult to tell uh, from a root level problem but that's also not a radicular pain so you should know that the difference there that wouldn't be the bottom line is neuralgia paralytica is not sciatica or not is not radicular pain. It's, it's a neuropathy. Uh, let's see what else. 
ridiculous ridiculitis is a ridiculous term so don't it doesn't isn't good for anything ridiculopathy you should read through this uh, it's very common even on our campus uh, testing uh, we're going to use radiculopathy and we really shouldn't be but because radiculopathy is the actual pathology that has to be confirmed uh, by at least objective findings uh, such as sensory loss, motor loss, deep tendon reflex change and really the purist should say like I'm a purist I guess uh, I think it should be confirmed by EMG and CV before making the diagnosis although that's a different issue the sensitivity and specificity uh, that's another for another day okay I would read through that, make sure you understand it. I think we went over that pretty good in class. But definitely understand this. So the ideology, the cause of radicular pain, there has to be, it's a double cause. It has to be compression and there has to be an inflammation. You can't have, you can have compression without radicular pain all the time. There's people, lots of people have stenosis and compressed nerve roots, yet they have no pain. So... It's got to be an inflammatory component. And who causes the inflammation? Things called cytokines, which we'll get to. Uh, definitely know this slide well. There's a question on this. Or there may be a question on this. Uh, disc herniation, stenosis, central and lateral stenosis, spondylolisthesis, especially, we talked about degenerative spondylolisthesis. Uh, remember, in ischemic spondylolisthesis, the beak, or in spondylolysis, the beak. Remember we talked about that? When the spondylo heals, uh, the callus formation, and panis formation, forms this sharp little ridge sometimes, which can compress the traversing nerve root underneath. So it can cause, uh, even a spondylolysis can cause radicular pain. Synovial cysts, we talked about, you know that. If you don't, you better know that. Remember, that's a, like a ganglion cyst that comes out of the facet joints, goes into the lateral recess and compresses the nerve. You can get those big tumors we talked about. Uh, and then, of course, fractures can do it. I think that's about it. Now, chemical irritation, you've got to know what tumor necrosis factor alpha is. right? That's the leader of this evil gang of biochemicals called cytokines that are very prevalent in degenerative tissue, especially in the disc. So you get a tear, rip in the disc, out come these cytokines, and they're fire starters. They can cause an inflammatory process, especially if coupled with compression of the adjacent nerve root structures. And you should know that if you get a patient with leg pain and it turns out to be real radiculopathy, not always, but more often than not, that is a serious condition and it's not going to be easy to correct. Uh, we're talking months to even years, and they may never completely cover. Like, I'm a perfect example. I had a three-level radiculopathy. Never recovered from it completely. I have my ups and downs, but, uh, you know, I can go walk up a hill, and I'll have leg pain for three or four days to this very day. So it's a horrible disease. So let's hope they don't have real radiculopathy. Yep, and that's what I said right there. Uh, know the risk factors. Okay, we went over these. Risk factors for radicular pain or sciatica, bad genetics. If your parents have it, your grandparents have it, you better watch out. You better encourage your kids to go to college and don't get one of these jobs because heavy manual labor increases the chances greatly. Sedimentary office work also does as well. That's why your patients who... Our sedimentary office workers, you have to encourage them to get up, take walk around breaks, you know, every at least every hour and a half. Don't let them and make sure they exercise. Long distance truck drivers, same. Night shift workers, I didn't include on here, I won't test you on that, but that's another strange phenomenon. Patients who people who do night shift work also tend to have uh, a higher incidence of herniated disc. Best occupation are jobs that require frequent change of position uh, and some moderate 
physical activity like a surveyor maybe who doesn't have to do too much heavy lifting he's out sitting in car walking around something like that okay and know these two so if these pictures and know something about this train of degeneration right here's a normal disc the process goes you get a blocking of these channels in the subchondral bone and remember we talked about how the disc is fed uh, by diffusion that's how it gets its nutrients how it gets its waste removed the most of the disc except on the very periphery so if you block off its feeding the disc cells will die the disc will start to dry out because of lack of proteoglycans and it'll get brittle and it'll start to bulge out so this bulge may be completely asymptomatic or this bulge has harbored a huge full thickness annular tear so asymptomatic horrible pain patient may need surgery for this yet on the MRI you know a lot of doctors will say oh nothing wrong with him he's got a simple bulge you know, seventy percent of people over forty have disc bulges which is true but we don't know you don't usually don't see this on MRI so they might be harboring an annular tear now if this pictures up there this blue things posterior longitudinal ligaments containing the protrusion so we have a small protrusion now these are the three flavors of disc herniation we have a protrusion aka subligamentous herniation but I don't use that term protrusion now the, the posterior longitudinal ligament is ruptured. Now we have an extrusion. These are usually over 7 millimeters, 6-7 millimeters in size. And then the third flavor of disc herniation is a sequestration. Sequestration. Okay, be familiar with this. We didn't talk a lot about lateral stenosis, but you might see this. So what's going on here? I'll give you a second. Don't miss this. Here's another slip. See, I like degenerative spondylose. Another slip. Now this one hasn't caused severe central stenosis. That doesn't look bad. See, here's the exiting root there. That's the, let's see, where are we? L5, L4 disc. So that's the L4 exiting root. Uh, but look at this. Where's the exiting root over here? Now this is all compressed. So we'll go to the sagittal view. You see we've got a protrusion. All this ligamentum flavum thickening. Uh, so this whole thing is slip it's called severe left lateral recess stenosis bottom line you see this left lateral recess stenosis secondary to degenerative spondylolisthesis go on and on about that hey we're almost done I think we're actually done this is the last week was pretty much show and tell you might want to remember what that is just to shake you up a little bit. Remember that's a burst fracture, Jefferson fracture. Okay, now this might be, you might see this as well. Okay, don't miss that. We got anytime bone expands like that, cells are going wild. Cells running wild and dividing, having babies and running wild, that's cancer. So this is metastatic disease from breast cancer again. And you can see, of course, we have a compression fracture, pathological collapse, secondary to metastatic disease from the breast. Okay, I think I've said enough. I mean, this is all good stuff to know, but I think that's a good review for you. It's probably about 50 minutes, which is more than I wanted. Let me just make sure. No other surprises. And we did get that correction right. Thank you for pointing that out. That the left anterior oblique, what what I got confused is I thought that you always named it by the side closest to the bucky. So in the left anterior oblique, the left pars is closest to the bucky. This is definitely the one you want to take, right? Is the farther away you get from the bucky, here's the bucky where the film is, uh, then the more magnification distortion you get. And you don't want that when you're looking for fractures. But in the left anterior oblique, you're actually looking at the side that's away from the bucky. So that's the right side. So apologize for that mistake. But there we've corrected it. And let's keep going.
I don't think this is all good stuff to know, but I think I've given you more than enough for this one credit class, which I think should be a five credit class, of course, but because this is your this is your life, right? This is your chiropractic life. Oh yeah, you might want to remember what that is. Corduroy appearance. Corduroy appearance. Hemangioma. But you don't even need to know that stuff. Just just know what it looks like. Might be on there. Okay, that's about it. I think. I've covered most of it. Study this stuff hard and you would do very well on the test. I've enjoyed having you all in class and good luck in ninth quarter and I'm sure I will see you guys around.